Chapter 6161 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Mary's POV I hurriedly moved about my room, meticulously double-dot-checking that I had packed every essential item for my upcoming journey to the prestigious Imperial Academy in the Hestia Empire. My mother was a flurry of concern, incessantly reminding me not to forget anything crucial. Despite my reassurances that I had everything covered, she reappeared with a forgotten robe in her hand and a playful scolding on her lips. I couldn't help but playfully bite my tongue, a mixture of amusement and exasperation in my eyes. All done. I said. The next leg of my journey would take me to the capital, where I would access the transportation portal to reach the port. Although I was confident in my abilities to navigate the bustling city on my own, my mother insisted on accompanying me, her protective nature shining through. Let's get outside, everyone's waiting for you. Mom called me, together, we embarked on our path, with the carriage awaiting us with an unexpected sight. Instead of the usual horses, my mother had arranged for majestic unicorns to pull our carriage, their presence adding a touch of whimsy to our journey. It's too costly, but my mother won't listen when I say it's fine if I use a normal carriage, she said it's more comfortable, and we can reach the capital in just three days. Just a second, and I'll be back. I hurriedly turned and ran into the house before crossing the threshold, and my mom followed me. Returning to my mother's collection room, a place filled with cherished memories and treasures, I found myself drawn to a black locker tucked away in the corner. With a flick of my hand, I unlocked it using a simple yet powerful magic spell. As the door swung open, I was greeted by the sight of my father's prized possession, a sword. Tizona. I softly called its name, there is a note beside it, but I didn't pick it up. I've read it like a thousand times already, and it always makes my mind clear and muddled at the same time. I gingerly picked Tizona, feeling the weight of its significance and the bittersweet memories it held. Zoop I carefully stored the sword in my spatial ring, a gift from my mother that held immense value, both sentimental and material. Do you have to bring it along? You still cannot use it. When my mother questioned the necessity of taking the sword, I couldn't find the words to respond. Some things are better left unspoken, their meaning understood in the depths of our hearts. Emerging from the confines of our home, I was greeted by the presence of my mother's close friends, a gathering of familiar faces that had become a part of my life. Among them were Ren's parents, individuals I hadn't seen since the dissolution of my engagement with their son. A mix of emotions swirled within me as we exchanged polite pleasantries. I do not hate them, they are good people, it's just that their son is the annoying one. Dot. When I remembered, I looked around. I did not find him here. Why is he not here? Did he not come to see me off? Why? Mary. Are you looking for someone? Mom asked me as she placed her hand on my shoulder, making me come out of my thoughts. Mom. Yes. Mom should know where that guy is. She's been meeting him to teach him something. I don't get it. Why would she waste her time on someone who doesn't have a speck of talent? He also manifested his element like two years later than normal, and it's also an inferno element, not a water element like me. Disappointing. Nope. I replied, I cannot think of anything or anyone else other than my goal right now, he'll come around either way. As we bid farewell and embraced one another, I felt a renewed sense of determination and resilience surging through my veins. The Imperial Academy beckoned, promising a world of knowledge, growth, and countless opportunities waiting to be seized. With my mother on my side, the carriage set into motion, the regal unicorns gracefully pulling us forward on our path through the sky. Through the carriage window, I stole a tender glance at my mother, our eyes meeting in a silent exchange of understanding and unconditional love. It was a glance filled with unspoken words. Are you thinking about why Ren didn't come? Mom asked tenderly without looking at me while reading a book. No, I am not. I answered, but deep inside I wanted to know, why didn't he show his stupid face when I was leaving the town? Well, it's his fault now, he won't be able to see me for like a whole year. 
Okay, I thought maybe you were. Mom flipped another page of her book. Gulp. Curiosity was winning over me, so I asked, why didn't he come? Still looking outside the window so that she wouldn't look at my face, I waited for the response. He left the Sephra a few days ago. Mom said calmly. What? I wasn't informed about this, how dare he? On the other hand that I in the heart of a dense, ancient forest, where sunlight struggled to penetrate the thick canopy, a young warrior honed his skills with a sword. His slender figure moved with grace and purpose, his bright blonde hair reflecting the dappled light that managed to filter through the dense foliage above. With each swing of his blade, he displayed a mastery of technique that belied his tender age of sixteen. Another day of training is complete. Adam said while exhaling deeply. Leaving behind a trail of fallen trees and shattered rocks, testaments to the intensity of his training, Adam paused to catch his breath. Beads of sweat trickled down his forehead, evidence of the physical and mental exertion he had poured into his practice. With a sense of satisfaction, he surveyed the forest, appreciating the tranquility that enveloped the sacred grove. This place has always been my refuge, a sanctuary amidst the chaos of the world. Adam said while admiring the surroundings. As he made his way back through the woods, the sound of rustling leaves accompanied his footsteps. He soon arrived at a familiar place. Aurora Haven, the name of the place. An orphanage nestled amidst the ancient trees. Warm smiles greeted him as fellow orphans and caretakers acknowledged his return. However, it was a small girl, barely reaching his waist, who caught his attention. She approached him with a mischievous gleam in her eyes and whispered something into his ear. Adam, guess what? William is here. He's waiting for you in the office. The girl whispered excitedly. William. He's back. That's amazing. Let's not keep him waiting. Adam's eyes widened extremely. Without a moment's hesitation, Adam's expression shifted, his eyes alight with excitement and anticipation. He swiftly made his way to the orphanage's office, where a man in his late twenties awaited him. It was William Stales, someone he regarded as a brother, despite their lack of blood ties. Adam, my boy. It's been too long. I'm thrilled to be joining you on this trip. William, having taken a break from his nightly duties, greeted Adam with a wide smile and open arms, ready to accompany him on their upcoming journey to the port. Eddie E.T. William, it's good to see you. I couldn't have asked for a better companion. The port won't know what hit it. Adam said while embracing William. As Adam emerged from the office, he retreated to his room, seeking solace in the cascading water of the shower. In the midst of his cleansing ritual, a familiar presence invaded his sanctum. It was his dear friend, Emily, who had wandered into the room unannounced. Curiosity sparked in Emily's eyes as she caught sight of a letter that Adam had received. Intrigued, she picked it up, holding the fragile parchment delicately in her hands. Adam, who is this letter from? It seems quite important to you. With a mix of intrigue and concern, she questioned Adam about the sender. It's from Mary, a girl I met a few years back. She's been sending these letters, asking for a rematch. Adam's gaze shifted to the floor as he confessed that the letters were from Mary, a girl he had crossed paths with years ago. In these letters, Mary pleaded for a rematch, an opportunity to reconnect. I see. And who is this Ren she mentions in the letters? Is he someone significant? Emily's inquisitive mind couldn't resist probing further. Her eyes fixated on a name mentioned in the letters, Ren. She questioned Adam about Ren's identity, Ren is a boy from Mary's neighborhood. He's been following her around, annoying her. She mentioned him as a sort of obstacle. Adam explained. However, Emily's intuition painted a different picture. An obstacle. Are you sure? It feels like she's trying to convey something else, like she's proud of his unwavering affection for her. Really? I hadn't considered that. But, no, Ren is just a persistent nuisance. 
I don't think Mary sees it the way you do. Adam denied Emily's statement. Emily perceived it as Mary's veiled attempt to boast about Wren's unyielding love, a declaration that he would forever follow her footsteps. In that moment, a tangled web of emotions and secrets unfurled, leaving Adam and Emily to ponder the true nature of Mary's letters and the underlying dynamics at play in this intricate tale of love and pursuit. After an hour Adam steps out of the orphanage, his heart heavy with a mix of excitement and uncertainty. William awaits, his mentor and guide. They board the carriage, and as the wheels begin to turn. Unaware of time's relentless advance, the world hurtles forward, chaos in its wake. People hold unknowing roles, bound by prophecy, as the clock's ominous ticking draws them nearer to destiny's precipice. Chapter 62 Capital You are listening at NovelFull.audio Hop I mounted the horse with a mixture of apprehension and determination. Riding was not a skill I possessed, but the urgency of our mission left me no choice but to learn quickly. As time passed, I grew more comfortable in the saddle, finding my balance and adapting to the rhythmic movements of the horse. Our journey to Virendale began with picturesque landscapes unfolding before us. Fields, forests, and winding trails painted the countryside. The sound of hooves hitting the ground echoed through the serene surroundings, accompanied by the occasional chirping of birds and rustling of leaves. Ollie, an experienced rider, took the lead, setting a steady pace. I followed closely behind, my focus split between the road ahead and the not-so-pleasant conversations that emerged between us. You've got a knack for horse riding, I mean. Ollie spoke, breaking the silence as we rode side by side. I glanced over with a hint of curiosity in my eyes. Is it? I asked. Yeah, it's unlikely for anyone to learn it in like a few hours, he said. True. I agreed. Now that I think about it, he only messes with me when we are around Annabelle. Maybe he likes her, I don't know, but it'll clear up a lot of things if that's the case. Hey, can I ask you something? I called out to him. If you are going to ask about something that's related to Annabelle, then I advise you not to do that because I don't want to argue when we are on an important mission. Ollie increased his speed. Don't go around sticking your nose in other people's issues. Or so he said, but he gave me a hint that'll help Annabelle mend things with him because he is the only one who still holds a grudge against her, otherwise, Barbara, Henry, and even Zark have consulted with each other. Our conversations came to a complete halt as we journeyed onward. For the next two days, we kept traveling with the minimum amount of rest, and then, it's here. Ollie remarks that as the sun began its descent on the second day, the town of Virendale finally came into view. Fatigue weighed heavily on our bodies, but a sense of accomplishment washed over us. The journey had been long and demanding, but we had persevered together. We made it, I said a mix of relief and satisfaction evident in my voice. Ollie nodded, a gleam of respect in his eyes. Indeed. With a shared understanding, we rode into the heart of Virendale. Virendale revealed itself as a bustling town nestled in the countryside. Quaint houses lined the streets, their facades painted in vibrant hues, adding a cheerful atmosphere to the surroundings. The main square buzzed with market stalls where merchants showcased their wares, filling the air with a medley of scents and sounds. The townsfolk hurried about their daily lives, their faces etched with the stories of a close-knit community. Ollie and I dismounted our horses, tethering them near the town's entrance, blending into the vibrant tapestry of Virendale. We strolled through the streets, taking in the sights and sounds that surrounded us. The aroma of freshly baked bread wafted from a nearby bakery, intermingling with the lively chatter of locals and the clattering of horse-drawn carriages passing by. I marveled at the architecture, admiring the intricately designed buildings that showcased the town's rich history. The cobblestone streets beneath our feet added a nostalgic charm, echoing with the footsteps of those who had walked them for generations. As we navigated the winding alleys, we couldn't help but notice the welcoming smiles of the townsfolk. 
shopkeepers beckoned us into their stores, offering a glimpse of Virendale's local craftsmanship, from delicate tapestries to ornate wooden carvings. Virendale proved to be a place of respite and refuge where the worries and dangers of our journey momentarily faded into the background. Yet our task loomed on the horizon, a reminder of the importance of our presence in this vibrant town. Virendale had welcomed us with open arms, and now it was our duty to repay the town's hospitality with unwavering dedication. As we continued our exploration of Virendale, a renewed sense of purpose filled me. The sights, sounds, and interactions with the townsfolk infused me with a renewed determination to fulfill our mission and protect what was at stake. We now have to get to the city center. I said, we are not going to rest in Virendale because it'll be a waste of time. Ali did say that we should get something to eat first, but I refused, we'll be able to eat when we are in the capital. There it is. At the center of Virendale stood the colossal transportation portal, a testament to the convergence of magic and engineering. The portal's immense power consumed a significant amount of mana, limiting its usage to only twice a day. This scarcity of mana made the portal a hub of frenetic activity as wealthy merchants who could afford the travel costs hurriedly made their way through. The creation of transportation portals was a complex process that required skilled enchanters and mages. Intricate patterns and symbols were inscribed on circular platforms, channeling mana to infuse them with intent. These enchanters unleashed a surge of mana, causing shimmering gateways to emerge, bridging realms for swift transportation. The portals facilitated trade and communication, connecting distant markets and fostering economic growth. They were a testament to the mastery of enchanters and the bending of space and time through the forces of magic. The portal's guardian, a nerdy figure with glasses perched on his nose, approached Ren, exuding an aura of quirky wisdom. How many people are there with you? Two, no luggage. I just answered what was needed. It'll be twenty gold coins each, meaning forty gold coins for both. He extended his hand forward, and I handed him the hefty sum of money, it's super expensive. As Ali and I approached the transportation portal, the sense of urgency in the air was palpable. Travelers and merchants rushed past, their footsteps echoing against the stone pavement. The enchanting glow of the portal's symbols and the crackling energy surrounding it further emphasized its mystical nature. I couldn't help but feel a surge of anticipation mingled with a tinge of apprehension, it's my first time traveling through the transportation portal. Taking a deep breath, Ali and I exchanged a determined glance. It's going to be a tough day, I murmured, acknowledging the obstacles that awaited us beyond the portal. Ali nodded in agreement, his eyes reflecting a steely resolve. Whoosh! With renewed determination, I tentatively stepped into the portal. A rush of exhilaration surged through my veins, blending with a tinge of nervousness. The world around me blurred and shifted, a kaleidoscope of vibrant hues enveloping my senses. The portal seemed to come alive, pulsating with a mysterious energy as if welcoming me into its enigmatic embrace. A sense of awe washed over me, for I knew that this was going to take me to the capital. After a few seconds. As I stood there, my senses were overwhelmed by the grandeur of the scene before me. The vast open ground stretched out in all directions, dotted with multiple portals similar to the one we had arrived from. People streamed in and out of the portals, creating a constant flow of activity and energy. Wow did it's really arcanum. It was a mesmerizing sight to witness the diverse array of individuals entering this bustling hub, Arcanum is the name of the capital. With a mischievous twinkle in my eye, I turned to Ali and couldn't resist cracking a joke. Well, Ali, I think maybe we should get a coffee first. To which Ali deeply sighed. After grabbing something to eat quickly, Ali and I approached the address Henry had given, I stood in before the magnificent house. The grandeur of the wealthy merchants abode overwhelmed me. Towering stone walls, weathered with time, displayed intricate carvings. The colossal wooden door, adorned with ornate metalwork, guarded the secrets within. Lush gardens surrounded the mansion, a testament to its owner's affluence we entered the mansion as some guards came to escort us. A few minutes after going into the mansion. 
There's a visible tension on Ali's face as he looked ahead of him and I also have some issues with this. So you are saying that we have to take that girl along with us? I asked cautiously. Yep. The stout guy nodded to my question like a total idiot. The girl stands before us, her entire form draped in long, flowing garments. A veil conceals her face, rendering her features a mystery. It's as if she is wrapped in a cloak of secrets, her presence captivating and enigmatic. Though her face remains hidden, I can sense determination emanating from her posture, a silent strength beneath the layers of fabric. Her eyes, veiled but piercing, hold a glimmer of intensity and purpose. Dot, how much? I asked, leaning back on the sofa. The merchant's face showed extreme innocence, as if he didn't understand what I was saying. Ha, don't make me say it again. I asked how much you're willing to offer for this sudden change, I let out an exaggerated sigh. Oh. Don't worry, I'll increase it by 50 gold coins. You just have to make sure both of them reach the destination, the merchant rubbed his hands together, but I could see him gritting his teeth beneath that tight dot lipped smile of his. A hundred. I'll need a hundred gold coins, or I can't guarantee this lady's safety, I stated firmly. I wasn't going to do this without a substantial raise in the price. What? That's absurd. He became extremely flustered. It would mean he has to spend 290 gold coins on a single package, a huge sum even for a wealthy merchant like himself. So, do we consider it a breach from your side? We won't have to repay the money you gave us in advance if you're the one breaching the contract, right Ollie? I turned to Ollie, who nodded. He surely keeps his mouth shut at important times. But it's you who increased the price out of nowhere. I'm not at fault, the merchant blabbered, as if thinking I would fall for his excuse. Well, it's you who changed the terms of the assignment, not once but twice. And as for the price, I don't think the court would look kindly upon our mercenary group if we value a human life at a mere hundred gold coins, am I right, sir? I explained, confident that even if this guy complained to higher dot ups, it would come back to bite him. Suddenly, the veiled girl leaned forward and whispered something to the merchant. He pondered for a while before the girl returned to her position. Okay, deal, the merchant finally agreed. Chapter 63 Ollie You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Annabelle's POV. Step step as I paced back and forth in the hotel room, my heart was consumed by a mix of anticipation and worry. It had been exactly four days since Ollie and Ren embarked on their journey to Virendale. Each passing moment felt like an eternity, and the weight of uncertainty pressed heavily upon me. My thoughts raced as I considered the dangers they might face on their expedition. While I had complete trust in Ali's skills and Ren's resourcefulness, I couldn't help but fear for their safety. The tension between Ali and Ren added an extra layer of concern, making me question if they would be able to put their differences aside and work together. Sitting down on the edge of the bed, I took a deep breath in an attempt to calm my racing mind. The room felt suffocating, as if it mirrored the turmoil within me. The truth was, something had changed within me since Ren entered my life. I had always been independent, shouldering my problems on my own. But when Ren came into the picture, I found myself opening up, sharing my worries and fears with him. He had become a confidant, a source of comfort in times of distress. A soft sigh escaped my lips as I allowed myself to reflect on our recent date. It had been a simple outing, nothing extravagant, yet it left an indelible mark on my heart. The way Ren looked at me, listened intently to my every word, and made me feel like the center of his universe, it was unlike anything I had experienced before. But the conflicting emotions within me couldn't be ignored. Amidst the warmth that swelled in my chest whenever I thought of him, there was also a tinge of frustration and confusion. Why is it so complicated? I whispered to myself, my voice barely audible in the quiet room. Ren's presence had awakened a whirlwind of emotions within me, leaving me with a maelstrom of feelings that I struggled to understand. He infuriates me, and yet, I can't help but adore him. I admitted, 
my voice barely above a whisper. It was true. Despite his stubbornness and the hurtful words he had uttered before leaving, I couldn't deny the deep affection that had taken root in my heart. A surge of frustration coursed through me as I recalled his dismissive remark about our shared moments being mere consequences of a drunken encounter. The pain it caused was undeniable, casting a shadow over the budding connection between us. But even in that moment, I couldn't deny the spark of something more profound that had passed between us, a connection that went beyond physical attraction. It's like I want that moment to happen again, but without the influence of alcohol, I muttered, my voice barely audible in the quiet room. The words hung in the air, an admission I struggled to comprehend. Stun. A sudden jolt shot through me, and I sprang up from the bed, my heart pounding in my chest. The thoughts that had entered my mind were jarring, even alarming. How could I dare to entertain such a notion? I recoiled at the mere suggestion that I would desire a repeat of that fateful night, when the influence of alcohol blurred the boundaries of our connection. No, no, I whispered, attempting to dismiss the unsettling thoughts that threatened to consume me. I was adamant about the fact that I had not been assaulted, that Ren's actions had not crossed that line. Yet, the conflict within me grew stronger with each passing second. Frustration and confusion mingled in my mind, weaving a tangled web of emotions. I tried to make sense of it all, to unravel the conflicting desires that pulsed through my veins. Ren's admission that his actions were a result of being intoxicated had cast a shadow over the genuine moments we had shared. But now, I found myself questioning the validity of his claim. My mind raced back to that night, replaying the scene with vivid clarity. Ren, consumed by the effects of the alcohol, had bared his soul, revealing a vulnerable side of himself. Yet, he had also exhibited a clarity of thought, effortlessly resolving the problems that had perplexed everyone else. It was a dichotomy that defied comprehension. Phew. I stood up and walked over to the window, gazing out at the city below. The twinkling lights of Eldoria illuminated the night, mirroring the conflicting emotions within me. It was true that Ren's actions that night had been influenced by alcohol, but there was more to it than a simple mistake. He had shown kindness, compassion, and a genuine interest in me that went beyond his inebriated state. A gentle knock reverberated through the room, pulling me out of my swirling thoughts. I approached the door and swung it open, revealing the towering figure of my friend, Barbara. She was known as Muscle Mommy among the guild members, a nickname that always intrigued me but remained shrouded in mystery. What happened? I inquired, my voice laced with a mix of curiosity and concern. Barbara's lips curled into a wide grin, a mischievous twinkle in her eyes. Kid is back, she declared, her words hitting me like a rush of cool breeze on a sweltering day. Relief washed over me, easing the knot of worry that had tied itself tightly within my chest. Without a moment's hesitation, I dashed down the stairs, my heart pounding with anticipation. And there he was, standing amidst the other members, Ren. A wave of elation surged through me as I locked eyes with him. His presence, as always, exuded a calmness that seemed to transcend any chaos or turmoil that life could throw our way. Good evening. Anna. Ren greeted me with a casual wave, his easygoing demeanor unfazed by the inner turmoil he had unknowingly stirred within me. How could someone be so effortlessly cool, even after wreaking havoc on my emotions without physically being present? A mix of emotions swirled within me, relief, joy, and an undercurrent of frustration. I couldn't deny the relief that washed over me at his return, a testament to the connection that had formed between us. But at the same time, a part of me couldn't help but feel a pang of annoyance at his nonchalant attitude. Nevertheless, I couldn't suppress the smile that tugged at the corners of my lips. It was good to see him, to have him back by my side. I mean our side. I approached Ren, my steps faltering for a moment as my gaze landed on an unfamiliar figure standing just behind him. Clad in a veil that concealed her features, she seemed to find solace in the protective shadow of Ren's presence. Questions flooded my mind as curiosity mingled with a hint of unease. Who is this woman? 
And why is she standing so close to him? Run, good evening, I greeted him, my voice carrying a mix of warmth and curiosity. I couldn't help but feel a slight twitch at the corners of my lips, a flicker of unease that I struggled to suppress. How was your journey, and who is this new friend of yours? Ren turned his head slightly, his eyes meeting mine. A soft smile played on his lips, but his expression held a trace of mystery. Ah, uh, Anna, this is the helper Layla that the merchant sent, he introduced, his voice holding a hint of affection as he glanced briefly at the veiled woman beside him. She's going to accompany us till we deliver the package. The veiled girl's eyes met mine from behind the veil, a gentle gaze filled with a mix of curiosity and gratitude. Despite the absence of words, there was a silent understanding between us, a recognition that our paths had intertwined in a way that we couldn't yet comprehend. As I studied the veiled figure, a mix of emotions stirred within me. It was a cocktail of curiosity, uncertainty, and a flicker of possessiveness that I couldn't quite understand why I felt. Suppressing my inner turmoil, I offered her a warm smile, trying to put my unease aside. It's a pleasure to meet you, I greeted her, my voice laced with genuine warmth, waiting for her to introduce herself. Layla's eyes sparkled with a touch of gratitude as she nodded softly. The enigmatic aura surrounding her only added to the intrigue, and I couldn't help but wonder what stories and secrets lay beneath that veil. She doesn't talk, Ren explained, his voice tinged with sympathy. The merchant informed me that she is mute. A pang of guilt washed over me as his words sank in. I hadn't considered the possibility that Layla might be unable to speak, and my insensitivity left a bitter taste in my mouth. Oh. I am so sorry, I quickly apologized, my voice filled with genuine remorse. I felt a rush of empathy for Layla, imagining the challenges she must face in a world where communication through words is a fundamental part of human connection. Ren proceeded to share the details of their journey, recounting the trials and adventures they had encountered. However, as he finished speaking, he abruptly excused himself, stating that he was tired and needed rest. Without another word, he ascended the stairs, leaving me standing there, a mix of confusion and frustration bubbling within me. Was I invisible to him? Did he not care about my presence? The annoyance resurfaced, fueled by a sense of being dismissed and unnoticed. It wasn't that he hadn't spoken to me, but rather that his interaction felt no different from how he conversed with everyone else. Anna. Come upstairs for a second, Ren's voice called out, and without hesitation, I found myself rushing up the stairs, my steps quick and eager. It was as if I had been waiting for that call, yearning for his attention. Entering his room, I noticed that it was different from the one I had glimpsed during my visit on his birthday. Ren had never once complained about his living arrangements, always maintaining his easygoing demeanor. What? I asked, my voice tinged with a sulky undertone that I couldn't quite explain. Why was I sulking? Was it because of his earlier words? Ha! Huh. Don't be so stiff, Ren chuckled lightly, his eyes meeting mine. Did he think I was being distant now? Why did you call me? I inquired, trying to mask my inner turmoil behind a facade of indifference. I wanted to hear what he had to say, and then I would express my own thoughts. Perhaps if we could have a genuine conversation, we could talk for hours and bridge the gap between us. It would be fun, right? Right. I think I might know how you can mend things with Ollie, Ren said, his face adorned with a smug expression. His words piqued my interest, and my heart skipped a beat. Really? I couldn't help but exclaim, a surge of hope welling up within me. After following Ren's advice and working hard to mend my relationships with Henry, Zark, and even Barbara, I had been hesitant to confront Ollie. If Ren had a solution, it was worth considering. Yep. Ren exclaimed, his eyes alight with confidence. He proceeded to share his thoughts, explaining his strategy to mend the rift between Ollie and me. It became evident that even during our journey, Ren had been pondering our team dynamic, specifically our unresolved conflicts. I don't think it'll work. In fact, it might only frustrate him further, 
I voiced my concerns, hesitant about the plan Ren proposed. It seemed risky, and I feared it could deepen the divide between Ali and me. Sighing, I pondered the situation, my mind racing with conflicting thoughts. Ren stepped forward, his gaze locked with mine, and he spoke with a gentle determination. Anna, he uttered my name, his voice carrying a hint of sincerity, believe me. My throat tightened, and I could feel my heartbeat quicken. Was it anticipation? Uncertainty. The tension between us was palpable, but to my relief and disappointment, Ren calmly stepped back, breaking the intensity of the moment. When do I have to do this? I finally asked, surrendering to the plan that Ren had devised. It was a matter of timing, and if we could resolve the conflict before leaving Eldoria, it would be for the best. Ren provided the necessary instructions, and I nodded, committing myself to the task ahead. As I left Ren's room, my heart was filled with a mix of emotions, hope, nervousness, and a burgeoning sense of connection. I took a deep breath before entering the deserted hall, my footsteps echoing in the silence. The flickering candlelight created a mysterious ambience, casting enchanting shadows on the walls. The air was heavy with anticipation, knowing that Ali was somewhere in this room, lost in his own thoughts. As I approached, I could see Ali sitting alone at a table, his face partially obscured by the dim glow while looking at the bottle in front of him. The sight of him in that moment stirred a mix of emotions within me, anger, frustration, but also a flicker of hope that we could mend what was broken between us. Summoning all my courage, I made my way towards him. The clacking of my heels on the polished floor seemed amplified in the stillness of the hall. With each step, my heart pounded in my chest, unsure of what awaited me. Ali's eyes met mine as I took a seat across from him. His expression was unreadable, guarded. It felt as if an invisible wall had been erected between us, and I was determined to break through it. Hey, I called out, my voice filled with a mix of determination and trepidation. Do you mind talking for a bit, I can't sleep at all. There was a brief moment of hesitation before Ali responded, his tone curt and distant. I have nothing to say to you, Annabelle. My frustration surged, and I refused to back down. I leaned forward, resting my elbows on the table, meeting his gaze unwaveringly. Well, how can a coward who used to pee his pants till he manifested his core be brave enough to face me, don't talk just pour me a drink? Ali's jaw tightened, his eyes flashing with a mix of anger and disgust. I knew it was a damn bad idea, Ren. Save me. Fuck off, I don't care if you are here to mock me, he cursed, his voice laced with bitterness. My heart sank at his words, realizing the depth of his hurt. But I couldn't let that deter me. Taking a deep breath, I steadied myself, ready to confront him head dot on. Taking a deep breath, I looked into Ali's eyes with sincerity. Ali, I want to apologize. I never meant to hurt you. Ali's eyes narrowed, his anger intensifying. Sorry. That's all you have to say. You think an apology erases the damage you've done, now I felt a surge of frustration, my own anger rising to match his, it's the same as Ren said, well, what do you want me to say, Ali? Should I grovel at your feet? Beg for forgiveness like a child. Maybe that's what you're looking for. His voice dripped with sarcasm. Oh, how generous of you, Annabelle. Offering me a chance to witness your impeccable acting skills. Bravo. I scoffed, unable to hold back. Impeccable acting. Coming from the master of bottling up emotions and pretending everything is fine. I feel angry and light at the same time. Ali's nostrils flared, his fists clenched on the table. You don't know a thing about me, Annabelle. You think you have me all figured out, but you're so blinded by your own selfishness. A smirk played at the corner of my lips. Selfishness. Oh, please. Coming from the person who used to be terrified of spiders and couldn't handle his own shadow. It's funny that I still remember the moment like it was something that happened yesterday. Ali's eyes widened in disbelief. You're really going to bring up my fear of big spiders. 
Well, let's not forget your irrational fear of clowns. I raised an eyebrow, ready to retaliate. Oh, so now we're exchanging childhood fears. How about the time you cried like a baby when a butterfly landed on your nose? Ali's face flushed with embarrassment. That was one time. And let's not forget your spectacular display of clumsiness when you tripped over your own feet in front of the entire guild. Laughter escaped my lips, despite the tension in the air. Ah, uh, yes. The legendary stumble that still gets mentioned at guild gatherings. At least I can admit to my clumsiness, unlike someone who's too proud to admit their faults. Ali's gaze hardened, his voice dripping with venom. I may have faults but I don't betray my friends. Shook asterisk I winced at his words, realizing the weight of his accusation. It hit me like a blow to the gut, shattering the lingering fragments of my defensive facade. I had betrayed his trust, and there was no denying it. The playful banter now felt like a sharp dagger between us. I, I know, Ollie, I stammered, my voice trembling with remorse. It was never my intention to betray you or our friendship. Who cares now, you can have fun with your new friend right, we are not needed anymore you'd be fine even without us. Ali spat these words, each word felt like a stab in the heart. I furrowed my brows in confusion, trying to make sense of Ali's words. New friend. I repeated, don't try to play innocent. It seems like you've been enjoying yourself ever since that kid came around. We all became invisible to you the moment you met him. Ali's words cut through me like a knife, leaving me breathless and filled with regret. His disappointment was evident, his voice heavy with a mix of anger and sorrow. I could see the hurt etched on his face, the longing for a genuine connection that seemed to have been shattered. I felt a sharp pang of disappointment as his words pierced through me. He believed that I had cast aside our friendship without a second thought, that I had chosen someone new over the bonds we had built together. The truth was far from that, but it was clear that I had failed to communicate my intentions and feelings to him. Taking a deep breath to steady myself, I locked eyes with Ollie. Ollie, I never meant to make you feel that way. I never intended to replace our friendship with anyone else. Ren is. Ali's gaze softened, a flicker of vulnerability crossing his features. Then why did you never come to me? Why did you make decisions without even talking to me first? His question hit me like a ton of bricks. In my pursuit of finding my own path and seeking solace in Ren's presence, I had unintentionally neglected Ali. The realization weighed heavily on me, and I felt a deep sense of remorse. I, I thought you were pushing me away, I admitted, my voice filled with a mix of regret and sadness. You seemed distant, and I thought I was becoming a burden to you. I didn't want to intrude or make things worse. As the weight of his disappointment settled upon me, a wave of realization crashed over me that he was right. I had acted without considering his feelings, without seeking his input or even giving him a chance to be a part of the decision-making process. I had let my own insecurities and desires guide my actions, neglecting the bond we had forged through years of friendship. Tears welled up in my eyes as I grasped the magnitude of my mistake. No, Ollie, you're wrong, I managed to choke out, my voice quivering with sincerity. I never wanted you to feel like you're not needed. I never wanted to hurt you. Ali's expression softened slightly, but the pain lingered in his eyes. Annabelle, actions speak louder than words, he said, his voice filled with a mixture of disappointment and longing. You didn't even give me a chance to be there for you, to help you through your struggles. You made the decision on your own, without considering how it would affect our friendship. His words pierced my heart, and I felt a deep pang of remorse. He was right. I had shut him out, believing that I could handle everything on my own. In doing so, I had inadvertently pushed away the one person who had always stood by my side. Tears streamed down my face as I reached out to him, my voice filled with desperation. Ali, I'm so sorry. Ali's gaze softened, and a flicker of hope appeared in his eyes. He took a step closer, his voice laced with a mix of vulnerability and longing. 
Annabelle, I want to believe you. I want to believe that our friendship can be repaired. But it will take time and effort from both of us. I need to see that you're willing to let me back in, that you trust me enough to share your burdens. With renewed determination, I nodded, my voice filled with sincerity. I promise, Ollie. From this moment forward, I will never make such a decision without consulting you, without considering our friendship. I will do everything in my power to earn back your trust. Tears streamed down my face as I stood there, overwhelmed by my emotions. After a few minutes, Ali's expression softened, fatigue etched on his face. He reached for a nearby bottle and sighed, his voice weary. Sit down, he said gently, surprising me. You wanted me to pour you a drink, right? I nodded, still trying to stifle my sobs, and took a seat. Ollie poured me a drink, his movements deliberate and careful. He broke the silence, his voice filled with remorse. I'm sorry for what I said earlier about Ren. Ren. I asked, puzzled by his apology. Yeah, I realized that my frustration wasn't really about him. It was about the fact that you approached him first instead of coming to me. I listened intently, finally understanding the root of Ali's hostility towards Ren. Hey, Ali, I called out, my voice trembling slightly. Hmm, he responded, looking at me with a mix of curiosity and weariness. What do you really think about Ren? I blurted out, unable to contain my curiosity any longer. Ali paused for a moment, contemplating his answer. Honestly, I didn't know what to make of him at first. He seemed like a mysterious and suspicious kid. But as we spent these few days together, I've come to realize that he's incredibly intelligent for his age. When that merchant sent that girl to us, I was at a loss, but Ren handled the situation with remarkable skill. As Ali praised Ren, a sense of pride swelled within me, accompanied by a newfound appreciation for Ren's capabilities. Yeah, it's incredible, I agreed, my voice filled with awe. Ren possesses a level of maturity that surpasses his age. Ali chuckled, a hint of amusement in his voice. Exactly. It's hard to believe that there's a 10.year age gap between us when we interact with him. His casual mention of Ren's age difference with me stirred a complex mix of emotions within me. It annoyed me. Everything fell into a hushed silence, and I took a leap of faith to break the ice. So, how are things going between you and Barbara? I asked, a mischievous glint in my eyes. Ollie flinched, and a deep blush crept up his cheeks, betraying his embarrassment. He had always been like a brother to me since childhood, so I knew all too well his feelings towards Barbara that had developed over the years. That's not something you should be concerned about, he blurted out, his words accompanied by a swift gulp of the drink in his glass. Steam seemed to emanate from his reddened face. I couldn't help but giggle at his adorable reaction, some things never change. A slash N, he he. He he he, I have some exciting news for you all. One, first of all, thanks to all you lovely people, we reached 300k views yesterday. That means we gained nearly 100k views in just six days. Two, get ready for the 25th of this month, because I'll be releasing a bunch of chapters all at once. I'm feeling so happy, and I want to share that happiness with you. 3. Now, this one may or may not make you happy, but let me tell you that for the next 30 to 40 chapters, you won't be getting other characters' points of view. I can change this decision if you want. 4. And finally, this news will surely make you ecstatic. I love you guys, I really do. Chapter 64 Leaving Eldoria You are listening at NovelFull.audio Is everything alright? Henry asked, glancing back at us. Annabelle gave him a thumbs up, indicating that things were going smoothly. I was glad to see that Henry and Annabelle seemed to be getting along well. Their camaraderie brought a sense of unity to our group, enhancing our overall morale. Anna, make sure to pack the food, or else we'll be stuck eating whatever culinary creation Henry comes up with, Ollie chimed in, joining us near the carriage, his hands full with supplies. 
Annabelle's face lit up with a cheerful expression. Don't worry, Ollie. I'll make sure we have some delicious meals while we're on the road. Her merry demeanor was infectious, spreading a sense of anticipation among us. Ho ho, it seems like your advice worked, Blaze's voice echoed in my mind, referring to the strategy one had suggested to Annabelle. BDNVL de M indeed, my advice to Annabelle had been fruitful. I had encouraged her to challenge Ollie to the point where he would either speak up or let loose with his characteristic fiery language. Either way, it was bound to lead to a resolution, as Ollie tended to be unfiltered in expressing his thoughts when pushed to his limits. With our preparations complete, we were ready to depart. I still hadn't quite grown accustomed to Layla's presence. There was an eerie aura surrounding her, and she maintained her veil, keeping her face hidden from view. Given the absence of any discernible magic emanating from her, I assumed she was a commoner. Let's go, Ollie declared, bringing his horse alongside mine. Our task was to guard the carriage from the outside, while Zark, Annabelle, and Barbara rode within the confines of the carriage alongside Layla. It was clear that Layla held the wooden box containing something of great value. As Henry initiated the carriage, the horses began their steady march, propelling us forward. Our next destination was Ivory Gate, a border town nestled between the Riva Kingdom and the Grav Kingdom. This time, we planned to travel continuously without any extended stops. It would take around 14 to 15 days to reach Ivory Gate, where our journey would conclude, and we would part ways. Hey Ren, how are you holding up? Annabelle leaned out of the carriage window, her green hair swaying in the wind. Annabelle had been in high spirits since reconciling with all of our friends. Her genuine happiness was contagious. I'm fine, I replied with brevity, mustering a small smile. My mind was occupied with numerous thoughts. Annabelle pouted and retreated back into the carriage, seemingly disappointed with my short response. Huh, you better not make her angry, man. That girl has a soft spot for you, Ollie chuckled, drawing his horse closer to mine and patting me on the back, consciously avoiding my shoulders. Ah, I wasn't trying to upset her. Just lost in my thoughts, I sighed, looking at him. But it's quite surprising to see you talking to me so casually and laughing. Ollie, who had always been abrasive towards me, was now unexpectedly friendly. Well, you know. Ollie glanced around, then met my gaze. I wanted to apologize for whatever I said to you. I wasn't in the right frame of mind, and my words were never intended to hurt you. Oh, that. I feigned surprise, though I had long suspected that Ali's animosity towards me wasn't genuine. Don't worry about it. It takes someone truly important to hurt me, and you didn't even come close. You just managed to annoy me a little, I replied nonchalantly. Ali's expression shifted, a hint of vulnerability surfacing. I don't know why that actually hurts my feelings, he admitted, his tone genuine. I couldn't help but feel a sense of empathy towards him. We all had our struggles and moments of vulnerability. Perhaps there was more to Ali than met the eye, a complexity beneath his gruff exterior. Well, let's leave it in the past, I offered, reaching out to pat him on the back in a gesture of goodwill. We're all in this journey together, and it's better to build bridges than walls. Ollie nodded, a small smile playing at the corners of his lips. You're right, Ren. It's about time we move forward and focus on the task at hand. Ollie said while I pondered what I would do once I parted ways with the group. Obtaining a reliable horse would be essential, as I planned to head towards the border crossing, then make my way to the Riva Kingdom, and from there, follow Blaze's suggestion to venture to the enigmatic Crooked Islands. While I still didn't fully grasp Blaze's intentions, I decided to trust his guidance for the time being. As I delved deeper into conversations with Blaze, the discrepancies between the game world I had known and the information he shared became increasingly perplexing. Our discussions unfolded like an unraveling tapestry, weaving a tale that challenged the very foundations of my understanding. The map, once a reliable guide to the lands and kingdoms I thought I knew, was now called into question. Blaze's words painted a new reality, 
one where the boundaries of realms shifted, and unexpected realms, such as the enigmatic demon kingdom, rose to prominence. Mermaids, once confined to the realm of myth and folklore, now claimed their existence in this magical world. The implications of Blaze's revelation extended far beyond mere geography. He claimed the power to alter bloodlines, a feat I had believed impossible within the confines of the game mechanics. It shattered the preconceived limitations I had come to accept, leaving me to ponder the true depths of this world's potential. Furthermore, Blaze spoke of an untamed and treacherous island, Crooked Island, housing a fabled dungeon of unparalleled strength. My knowledge had always pointed to the Hestia Empire as the seat of such power, a beacon yet to be discovered. The incongruity between reality and perception danced before my eyes, beckoning me to question everything I thought I knew. Perhaps the most staggering revelation of all lies in the existence of multiple gods. In the realm of the game, only Elora, the goddess of light, held sway. But according to Blaze, a pantheon of deities presided over this magical realm, each with their own dominion and influence. The implications of such divine presence ignited a sense of awe and uncertainty within me. The world that once appeared familiar is now unfurled before me as a tapestry of mystery and contradiction. The game's boundaries had expanded beyond imagination, challenging the very essence of what it means to inhabit this magical realm. With every revelation, my sense of wonder and anticipation grew, for within the intermingling of truth and fiction lay the potential for extraordinary adventures and uncharted territories yet to be explored. Well, let's not jump on the conclusions it's all just assumptions. We rode side by side, guarding the carriage as it continued its steady progression towards Ivory Gate. The passing scenery unfolded like a breathtaking tapestry, lush fields, shimmering rivers, and ancient forests, all bathed in the warm hues of the setting sun. The rhythmic clip dot clop of hooves on the road accompanied our journey, creating a soothing symphony that reverberated through the surrounding landscape. As dusk casts its gentle veil upon the world, we set up camp for the night. The crackling fire illuminated our tired faces, forging a bond that went beyond the boundaries of our initial agreement. We shared tales, laughter, and even moments of vulnerability, strengthening the foundation of our newfound camaraderie. As the days blended into nights, and nights transformed into days, the landscape transformed around us, painting a breathtaking panorama with each passing mile. Throughout our week-long journey, Layla's enigmatic presence remained a constant source of intrigue. Draped in her veiled attire, she exuded an air of mystery and quiet strength. Though her inability to speak restricted her communication, her actions spoke volumes, as she remained ever vigilant, never straying far from the precious wooden box she safeguarded. Occasionally, I caught fleeting glimpses of Layla's eyes beneath her veil, deep, contemplative orbs that held untold stories within. Her silence only seemed to enhance her aura of trustworthiness, as if she had taken on the role of a steadfast guardian, dedicated to ensuring the safe delivery of the invaluable cargo. Yet, despite her presence, questions lingered in the back of my mind, taunting me with their elusive nature. What secrets did Layla hold? Why had the merchant in Arcanum chosen to entrust a mute non-mage with such vital responsibility? The incongruity of it all gnawed at my curiosity, fueling a mixture of fascination and caution. But for now, I respected Layla's silence, realizing that the answers would reveal themselves in due time. In the midst of our journey, Blaze's voice echoed in my mind, expressing the same doubts that plagued me. It just doesn't add up, he murmured, his thoughts mirroring my own. Yet, despite the unanswered questions, I found myself drawn to Layla's enigmatic presence. It added a captivating layer to our adventure, a touch of intrigue that made each day on the road all the more exhilarating. With every step forward, I silently hoped that the mysteries surrounding Layla would eventually unravel, illuminating the path before us and revealing the greater purpose that lay ahead. Ha, ain't we in a bind now, I muttered under my breath, gazing ahead at the obstacle that lay before us. We had already completed half of our arduous journey, and now it seemed that we were faced with a daunting challenge. As we faced the dense expanse of the sprawling forest ahead, a knot of unease twisted in my stomach. 
It wasn't the forest itself that gave me cause for concern, after all, we had traversed through various landscapes and encountered their own set of challenges. No, what truly troubled me is that the whole forest is the... It's an illusory forest path. Chapter 65 Illusory Forest Path You are listening at NovelFull.audio Hold on a minute, Henry interrupted, his brow furrowing in confusion. Are you saying that this entire forest has transformed into an illusory forest path? But that's not how it used to be. Ollie chimed in, his voice laced with skepticism. Yeah, I've been through this forest before, and it was just a regular forest. How did it suddenly turn into an illusion? It's as if the very fabric of reality has shifted, I muttered, my eyes scanning the mysterious forest before us. Blaze, do you have any idea why this could have happened? Silence hung in the air for a moment, as if even Blaze was contemplating the inexplicable nature of this phenomenon. Then, his voice resonated in my mind, tinged with a hint of uncertainty. I can't say for certain, but it's possible that powerful magic is at play here. The illusory forest path is a rare occurrence, typically associated with ancient enchantments or the influence of magical artifacts. My eyes gleaming with curiosity, I asked. So, you're saying that someone intentionally turned this forest into an illusion. But why? Blaze's response was laced with intrigue. There could be various reasons, my friend. Perhaps there's a hidden treasure or a valuable artifact concealed within the forest. Or maybe it's a defense mechanism to keep trespassers at bay. Trespassers. I thought it was interesting. Zark, usually the reserved one, couldn't contain his excitement. Well, whatever the reason, it sounds like we're in for quite the adventure. I've always wanted to test my skills against illusion magic. Annabelle playfully nudged Zark. Careful what you wish for, Zark. Illusions can be quite deceiving. They can twist your perception and lead you astray. Ollie crossed his arms, his eyes scanning the forest with caution. I don't know about you all, but I've had my fair share of encounters with illusions. They're never as harmless as they seem. Okay then let's go, it'll take like a day to cross the forest. Henry said, there's nothing to worry about illusions if it's only illusion. Hey, Ollie. I called, give me a sword. I requested, here, he passed me an extra sword from the carriage I think it's going to be fun inside. And now, Barbara, Annabelle and Zark get inside the carriage and guard Layla. Ollie keep your horse a little behind me, you too Harry. I'll lead ahead. I explained the instructions. Silence. What? I looked at them and saw they were looking at me with a curious gaze, do they not get my words at all? Nothing, it's like you are used to giving out orders. Henry scratched the back of his head. And I think you should go inside and I'll guard instead of you since you are inexperienced. Zark stepped forward, it'll take days if I leave this task to these guys. Nope, I said get inside and believe me, I'll make us get out of it by the sunset. I was not in the mood to argue with anyone. Ha fine just make sure you don't get scared of the illusions. Zark rubbed his temples and went inside along with others. I'll be at the front. I brought the horse in front of the carriage and with a shared resolve, we entered forward, venturing into the illusory forest path. Every footfall stirred a kaleidoscope of illusions, distorting our surroundings and playing tricks on our senses, the forest transformed before our eyes. Trees morphed into strange shapes, the path twisted and turned, and whispers of ethereal voices filled the air. This place is playing with our minds, Henry muttered, his voice tinged with unease. Stay alert. Zark gripped his staff tightly, scanning the surroundings with vigilant eyes. Don't worry, Henry. We've faced tough challenges before, and we'll get through this. I couldn't help but think, someone, tell this guy to shut his mouth. As we pressed on, the forest seemed determined to test our resolve at every turn. Illusory monsters lurked in the shadows, their forms flickering and shifting. The sound of footsteps echoed from all directions, but their origin remained elusive. 
It was as if the forest itself reveled in toying with our sanity. The sudden appearance of the illusory forest path had caught us off guard. The entire forest hadn't become an illusion, but rather specific parts had been altered with illusions. It was a partial illusion, affecting only certain areas. The intricacy of this illusion indicated the involvement of a powerful mage or a formidable mana beast. Yet, considering the remote location, both possibilities seemed unlikely. Creating such a sophisticated illusion would require a mage of at least seven stars or an SSS class mana beast. Taking a moment to assess the situation, I realized that the forest had transformed into a perplexing puzzle. The distorted trees and flickering glow hinted at a manipulation of reality beyond my comprehension. I couldn't help but wonder who or what possessed the ability to weave such illusions in this secluded place, whenever we encountered an object or a barrier, we would reach out and physically touch it to confirm its reality. This way, we could distinguish between real obstacles and illusory ones. Dot after a few hours had passed, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease as I looked ahead. Ha! Huh. I muttered, my thoughts echoing the strange circumstances we found ourselves in. Zark, seemingly unfazed, chimed in, See, I told you it would be easy. We cleared that illusory forest path in one go, and now we're outside the forest, on a well-dot-paved road. But something about it all felt off, as if it were too. Easy. We had ventured into the depths of an intricate illusion, yet we emerged unscathed without facing any significant challenges. It left me with a lingering sense of restlessness and an unsettling feeling in my gut. Turning to Blaze, who could sense my emotions from within, I sought his perspective. What do you think, Smokeball? Does this situation feel right to you? In response, Blaze conveyed his uncertainty. I don't know. It's difficult to gauge. It all seems too convenient, doesn't it? It's as if the path was laid out for us, almost unnaturally so. His words resonated with my own doubts, deepening the mystery surrounding our journey. Could this apparent ease be a deliberate ruse or a clever manipulation? Questions swirled in my mind, intensifying my curiosity and urging me to uncover the truth that lay beneath the surface. Let's keep going. Henry said, his eyes fixed on me, silently questioning if I was still going to lead the way. Thud, feeling a sudden wave of exhaustion and a pounding headache, I dismounted from the horse. Zark, take over for a moment. I need to rest, I instructed, my voice strained. Zark stepped out of the carriage, confusion evident on his face as he tried to make sense of my sudden decision. Entering the carriage, I noticed Barbara's curious gaze upon me. I approached her and spoke softly, Barbara, may I borrow your lap for a moment? I just need to rest. I leaned without waiting for her affirmation. What? Barbara squealed in surprise, taken aback by my unexpected request. Before she could react further, I felt two small hands grip the back of my head tightly, pulling me backwards. Dot. Startled, I found myself once again resting my head on someone's lap, but this time it wasn't Barbara's. Anna. I looked up at Annabelle with a puzzled expression, trying to make sense of the situation. You should have told me if you weren't feeling well. There was no need to bother Barbara, humph. Annabelle scoffed, expressing her annoyance. I hadn't thought much about it, I simply wanted to lie down quickly, and since the space beside Barbara was unoccupied, I assumed it would be more comfortable to rest there. Well, this isn't too bad either, I mused, feeling a mix of surprise and curiosity. I glanced at Annabelle's face, which had turned red from embarrassment. As the carriage began to move, my mind continued to churn with the same questions, replaying them over and over again what was that. Once the carriage was out of sight, something peculiar occurred, a humanoid figure emerged from the forest, gazing in the direction the carriage had departed. His presence exuded an aura of darkness and power, leaving others with an unsettling feeling. He stood tall and imposing, adorned in obsidian armor that reflected a sinister light. With crimson eyes and flowing ebony hair, he emitted a calm yet menacing aura. His demeanor commanded respect and instilled fear, 
symbolizing formidable power and cunning intellect. Step, step. General Zephyrion. Footsteps resonated, and another demon with horns sprouting from his head knelt before Zephyrion. What's the progress? Zephyrion asked, his voice low and gruff. We are halfway through. It will take two more days to complete the inscription of the magic circles, the demon reported, his gaze fixed on the ground. Stand guard here. I will investigate myself, Zephyrion declared as he walked past the kneeling demon. As Zephyrion entered the forest, the demon exhaled with relief, knowing his life depended on his behavior. Zephyrion, who were they? A woman approached him, emanating an alluring yet unnerving presence. Her lithe figure was draped in flowing garments of deep obsidian, accentuating her serpentine grace. Her eyes, still possessing their venomous intensity, held a captivating gaze. Dark, coiling tattoos snaked across her alabaster skin, adding an aura of mystery to her already enigmatic persona. She didn't bow before him, nor did he, as if they were equals. Vexus, just some wandering mercenaries, nothing significant, Zephyrion replied, although his thoughts dwelled on something else. Are you certain? I sensed someone powerful inside that carriage. Someone with at least a six. Star human power level. I wouldn't have detected it if not for this artifact. Vexus displayed a radar dot-like artifact in her hand. You're concerned about that? Zephyrion questioned, seemingly unconvinced by her doubt. Was there anything else to be concerned about? Vexus raised an eyebrow. Zephyrion regarded her for a moment, then said, No, don't worry and continue your work. The liege will not show us mercy if we fail to complete our task. He dismissed the topic. Yes, it'll take like a year or so to cover up this continent but we'll make sure that the liege is content with our work. Vexus nodded and moved ahead. Once the demoness was out of sight, Zephyrion muttered to himself, that dark dot-haired boy, he nearly saw through me. Chapter 66 Dreadclaw Part.1 You're listening at novelfull.audio. We have arrived at the designated location, Henry declared, breaking the silence. Retrieve the provisions. Ah, it's time for lunch. Barbara exclaimed, her excitement evident as she quickly exited the carriage, displaying unexpected agility despite her small stature. Observing Barbara's energetic departure, I decided it was time for me to rise as well. I adjusted my posture gradually, sitting upright and reluctantly leaving behind the comfortable pillow that had served as my solace over the past few days. Initially, I sought solace on that soft cushion only once to calm my racing thoughts. However, Annabelle suggested that it would be beneficial for me to rest in that position. Well, I couldn't complain about having such a luxurious cushion for support. Dot, Annabelle. I called out to her, noticing the faint blush on her cheeks as she kept her gaze fixed on her own lap. I gently tapped her shoulder to get her attention. Ha! Huh. Annabelle looked up, her eyes seemingly lost in a whirl of spirals. It's time for lunch. We should go, I repeated, hoping to bring her back to the present moment. Why dot yeah, let's go, Annabelle responded, slightly startled by my sudden reminder. Stepping outside of the carriage, we proceeded to organize the food and prepare plates for everyone to enjoy. As we distributed the meals, I noticed Layla silently taking her plate and retreating back into the carriage, remaining hidden from our view as she always did. Over these past few days, I have observed and confirmed a few things about her. First, she possesses the ability to use magic and fight, but she is utilizing some kind of concealer artifact to suppress her mana. I have observed her eyes attentively following the flow of mana, which is only visible to individuals who possess the ability to sense mana, such as a mage. Non-mages can only perceive manifested spells, but whenever one of us employs any form of magic, she seems to discern the flow of mana as her eyes track its particles along the same trajectory. Secondly, I strongly doubt that she is mute. Sometimes, she appears to mutter to herself in the middle of the night. Although the sound is faint, 
my heightened sensitivity allows me to pick up on it. Lastly, she exhibits an unnaturally strong attachment to that box. I am impressed, princess. You don't seem like the type to notice such details, Blaze remarked, leaving me uncertain whether he was complimenting or insulting me. I haven't mentioned anything about it because it does not concern us. She could be a trained guard assigned to protect the box but has some reason to conceal her identity. Who knows? As long as we receive our payment and I am able to reach Ivory Gate, all is well. It's a good thing that you left Sephra with these guys, or else it would have taken two months to reach our destination, right? Blaze stated the obvious. If I were alone, I don't believe it would have been as easy or fast to arrive here. As we gathered around to enjoy our lunch, the atmosphere remained tinged with a sense of mystery. Layla's withdrawal into the carriage intrigued me, but I respected her need for privacy and decided not to pry. Instead, I focused on the task at hand. Satisfying our hunger. The provisions we had brought were carefully selected to ensure a variety of flavors and sustenance. The aroma of freshly cooked food permeated the air, awakening our senses and tantalizing our taste buds. We sat together, savoring each bite and engaging in casual conversations. Henry, always the jolly one, shared anecdotes from our previous adventures, eliciting laughter and smiles from the group. Ollie, with his quick wit, added humorous remarks that kept the lively banter going. Annabelle, though still slightly flustered from earlier, gradually relaxed and joined in the cheerful chatter. Hey, that's a cool bracelet you have there, Barbara remarked, glancing at my wrist. Oh, this. It's a gift, I replied, referring to the silver bracelet adorning my left wrist. I had kept it safely tucked away in my luggage, but today I felt like wearing it. The bracelet featured a marble dot-sized amethyst dot-like rock in the center, a Thargtusk's mana core. It's the same core from that day, right? Annabelle asked, recognizing the unique piece. Yep, it is, I confirmed. Marilyn had gifted me this on my birthday, intending it to serve as a memento of my first hunt. She purchased the entire corpse of a Thargtusk from Annabelle before it could be sold to the guild. Then, she took its core to a skilled artisan who crafted the bracelet over a span of three days. The bracelet had a few runes that allowed it to emit a soft glow in the dark, but its purpose was primarily ornamental. It made for a stylish accessory. As we indulged in the meal, I couldn't help but marvel at the bonds that had been rekindled during our journey. Just two more days remained until we reached our destination. After the satisfying meal, we tidied up the empty plates and remnants, leaving no trace behind. Ren, Annabelle approached me, avoiding direct eye contact. She's about to say something embarrassing, I instinctively realized. Whenever she fidgeted and avoided making eye contact, it often led to her saying something and then getting flustered. It was rather endearing. What is it? I inquired, my curiosity piqued. Um. Can I call you Ro? Annabelle dropped an unexpected bomb. Ha. Huh. I was momentarily stunned, trying to comprehend this new turn of events. Ah. No, don't get it wrong. I just thought that since we're good. No, great friends, maybe we should use nicknames for each other. When I visited your house, I noticed your mom and aunt calling you Ro, and I thought it would be nice if I could call you. I mean, it would deepen our friendship, and... Annabelle stumbled over her words, becoming increasingly flustered. Hey, relax. I interrupted her rambling and said, you can. Since I always call you Anna instead of Annabelle, you can call me Ren or any name you'd like. Get it? Annabelle nodded, resembling a three-year-old child. I chuckled at her reaction and headed back inside the carriage, but to my surprise. Tuck. Something tapped the hem of my sleeve, and I turned to see Annabelle. Hey, you'll leave after we arrive at Ivory Gate, right? Annabelle's voice held a note of uncertainty. Did she want to confirm it? Yep, I'll be going my own way and exploring the kingdom as a true adventurer, I replied, 
spouting the old cliché. In truth, I wouldn't be in this kingdom for much longer. Can I ask you something? Annabelle hesitated, prompting me to wait for her to continue. I want you to keep traveling with these guys, even after I leave the group. I think you all should stick together. It will provide you with valuable real.life experience, and... Annabelle paused mid-sentence. And... I prodded. And it will be safer for you too, she finally revealed, her words weighed with concern. I understood her feelings. From her perspective, I was just a teenager not yet mature enough to take care of myself. Moreover, Annabelle herself wouldn't be around for long, as she was pursuing her dream job. She wanted me to stay with her friends so they could keep an eye on me. I don't think that's the only reason, Blaze chimed in, his voice lingering with suspicion. Listen, Annabelle, let me assure you that embarking on this journey alone is something I must do for my personal growth. Don't worry, it'll be fine. You've only recently returned to your previous life, and you have your friends here. Cherish your time with them and don't dwell on anything else, I reassured her before stepping back into the carriage. It's better for her to be concerned about people who will be with her for a long time, rather than worrying about someone she only just met who is parting ways soon, right? Are you not going to meet her again, princess? Blaze asked, seeming oblivious to my words. Once I leave Ivory Gate alone, I doubt there will be any chance for Anna and me to cross paths again. She will live her life, and I will live mine. That night, the carriage continued its steady pace through the dark night. No moon illuminated the sky above. Inside the carriage it was me, Zark, Barbara, and Annabelle, who had settled beside me with her head gently resting on my shoulder as she drifted off to sleep. Eminem fro, don't do that, it hurts, Annabelle mumbled in her sleep. I wondered what kind of dream she was having, hoping it wasn't something too mischievous. I highly doubt it's not a mischievous one, Blaze interjected. Suddenly, a thunderous thud reverberated from outside, followed by Ali's voice shouting, It's Dreadclaw. Chapter 67 Dreadclaw Part.2 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Dreadclaw is a notorious bandit group that has been plaguing the region for years. Composed of ruthless and cunning individuals, they are known for their brazen acts of robbery, pillaging, and violence. As the menacing proclamation of Dreadclaw echoed through the night, adrenaline surged through my veins, dispelling any remnants of drowsiness. I swiftly pushed Annabelle away, gently rousing her from her slumber. Annabelle, wake up. We're under attack, I urgently whispered, shaking her shoulder. Her eyes fluttered open, still groggy from sleep, but soon widened with alarm as she registered the urgency in my voice. What? Dreadclaw. Here. Annabelle exclaimed, her voice trembling with a mix of fear and determination. She quickly sat up, rubbing her eyes to clear away any remnants of sleep. I turned my attention to the others in the carriage, alerting them of the impending danger. Zark, prepare your magic. Annabelle, get ready to use your wind spells. Henry, Ollie, be on guard. Barbara, strengthen your body with mana and be ready for a brawl. Each member of the group sprang out of the carriage and took the positions. I stood at the forefront, my heart pounding with a mixture of anticipation and interest. The bandits before us, known as the Dreadclaw, were a motley crew of rogues and misfits. They bore the marks of a life steeped in lawlessness, their tattered and mismatched attire blending seamlessly with the shadows of the dense forest. The leader of the Dreadclaw, stood at the helm, his wiry frame exuding an air of confidence and malevolence. His eyes glinted with a twisted hunger for power, and his grin revealed a mouthful of yellowed teeth, adding to his menacing aura. Behind him, the bandits fanned out, each one displaying varying degrees of skill and ruthlessness. Fush flames danced in my hands, the heat of my magic warming my palms and fueling my determination. I took a deep breath, centering myself amidst the chaos unfolding around me. Stay close and watch each other's backs. Henry called out to his companions, his voice steady despite the adrenaline coursing through the veins. 
We formed a tight dot knit circle, our weapons at the ready and our spells prepared to unleash devastation upon our foes. With a flash of movement, the battle commenced. I launched a fiery barrage, sending firebolts streaking through the air, each one finding its mark with deadly precision. The crackling flames engulfed the bandits, causing them to cry out in pain as their clothes caught fire. ZRHRH the enigmatic sorcerer of this group, Zark. Chanted incantations that resonated with arcane power. Henry and Ollie, two steadfast swordsmen, engaged the bandits in close combat, their blades flashing with deadly precision. Their years of training and battle.Hardened skills were evident as they parried and countered the bandits' attacks, their strikes swift and lethal. Barbara, the brawler, channeled her mana, enhancing her strength and endurance. With a roar, she charged into the midst of the bandits, her fists glowing with raw power. Each blow she delivered was like a thunderous earthquake, sending shockwaves through the air and shattering bones. And Annabelle. Ha Annabelle, unlike others, Annabelle stood close to the carriage, visibly shaking. It's not easy to let go of past trauma. Anna. Keep Layla safe and don't come here, we'd cover for you. I said, there's no point in getting her involved here if she is scared. Amidst this chaos, I focused on my fire magic, weaving spells. BDNV, I could see that we were outnumbered. The bandits swarmed around us, their numbers seemingly endless. They were a motley crew, clad in tattered garments and adorned with crude weapons. Some wielded swords and daggers, while others brandished bows and arrows. Among them, I could spot at least twenty bandits, each exuding a menacing aura. Despite their ragtag appearance, these bandits were amateurs. Many of them displayed proficiency in different schools of magic, adding an extra layer of danger to their attacks. The wind mages darted with incredible speed and launched razor-sharp gusts, attempting to slice through our defenses. The fire mages conjured blazing infernos, engulfing the battlefield in searing flames. The earth mages summoned massive boulders and jagged rocks, hurling them at us with tremendous force. And the water mages manipulated the nearby streams and created powerful water spouts to drown us in their elemental fury. Henry and Ollie engaged multiple opponents, their blades weaving a deadly dance as they swiftly dispatched their foes. Barbara unleashed devastating punches and kicks, her mana. Infused strikes shattering bones and sending bandits flying. I concentrate on my fire spells. I unleashed torrents of fireballs, engulfing groups of bandits in explosive infernos. The crackling flames illuminated the battlefield, casting an eerie glow on the chaos that unfolded around us. I have to use the spells wisely or I'll be out of mana, in this group I am the only one who is a two-star mage, otherwise everyone is above three stars and Zark is the only one at five stars. But these bandits have a three-star mage age at max the only thing that is the issue is that they are in a mob. Tap as the chaos unfolded around me, my attention honed in on a figure that leaped in front of me with a menacing glint in his eyes. It was one of the bandits, armed with a sharp sword and a malicious intent. Without hesitation, he propelled himself forward with a burst of speed, closing the distance between us in an instant. Instinctively, I reacted, my body moving on pure reflex. I swiftly shifted my weight, leaping backward to create distance between us. The bandit's sword swished through the air, narrowly missing me as I evaded his vicious strike. The metallic clash of our weapons echoed through the air, a testament to the intensity of our confrontation. I still have the sword that Ollie gave me as a spare. Knowing that I had to retaliate, I focused my concentration and channeled my magical energy. With a swift motion of my hand, I conjured a firebolt, its fiery essence crackling with power. I launched the projectile towards my adversary, fully expecting it to connect. However, to my surprise, the bandit's agility proved formidable as he deftly dodged the searing flames, narrowly evading their destructive path. Undeterred, I recalibrated my strategy. Sensing an opportunity, I channeled mana into my lower body, empowering my legs with a surge of energy. With a burst of speed, I lunged forward, delivering a powerful kick towards the bandit's midsection. 
but he was no novice in combat. Reacting swiftly, he brought his mana dot clad sword in the path of my attack, parrying my blow with a resounding clash. The force of the impact reverberated through my body, threatening to throw me off balance. I quickly recalibrated, shifting my weight to maintain my stability. The bandit sword, infused with his own magical prowess, stood as an impenetrable barrier, preventing my strike from finding its mark. It was a critical moment that demanded split.second decision.making. Instinctively, I halted my attack, realizing that to continue would have put my own limb in jeopardy. Adrenaline surged through my veins as the intensity of the battle reached its zenith. The dance of steel and fire continued, each move calculated and precise. Amidst the chaos of battle, the urgency in Henry's voice broke through the clamor. Make sure we don't kill them, he shouted, his words echoing in our ears. Confusion flickered across my face as I turned to look at him, searching for an explanation. His gaze was fixed on something, a particular direction that piqued his concern. I strained to follow his line of sight, attempting to decipher the reason for his unusual request, but before I could comprehend his intentions, a sudden impact reverberated through my body. The force of a bandit's punch connected with brutal precision, striking my jaw with a jolt of pain. Helplessly, I was sent hurtling through the air, akin to a lifeless puppet flung aside with disdain. As I tumbled, my mind raced to process the abrupt turn of events. Henry's plea for restraint now seemed incongruous, lost in the pandemonium of the skirmish. It was becoming evident that our desperate struggle had devolved into an unrestrained clash, where the preservation of life took a backseat to survival. Casting off the days that threatened to cloud my senses, I regained my footing with a surge of determination. Blood trickled from my split lip, gritting my teeth, I wiped away the blood staining my chin, a symbol of the price I had paid for underestimating the stakes and looking aside of this encounter. In this moment the notion of holding back, as Henry had suggested, felt increasingly distant and impractical. With a renewed sense of purpose, I locked eyes with my assailant, I'm afraid I can't make that promise, Henry, I muttered under my breath. Chapter 68 Dreadclaw Part.3 You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. I adjusted my jaw, wincing at the pain. That guy put everything he had into that one punch. Are you going to kill him? Blaze asked, picking up on my thoughts. Yep, I am going to kill him, I replied. I didn't care what anyone else thought. No one dares to lay hands on me and expect to get away unscathed. You're with the group, remember. What happened to keeping a low profile and not letting them know you're a psychotic killer, Blaze's nagging didn't even make sense to me anymore. Who's the real psychotic killer here? I never intended to hide the fact that I can kill. My goal was to conceal the fact that I slaughtered a group of goons and disposed of their bodies. Getting back on my feet, I relaxed my body and retrieved the fallen sword. I had infused it with my mana, though I couldn't reinforce it with fire due to the lack of magical prevention inscriptions. However, I could still envelop it in a layer of raw mana and coat it with fire. It would damage the sword, but it was a sacrifice worth making. Swing I took the position, lowering myself a little and pointing the horizontally towards the bandit. For taking a deep breath I relaxed my raging heart and ceased all anger from my soul, every minute desire and only one thing was now the goal of this fight. I'll kill every single one of them. I swung the sword and dashed forwards, I've never actually learned a shit about swordsmanship but I am quite proficient in martial arts so it's all on my instincts on how I fight as far I've seen Ali and Henry fight they fight very systematically and to me it seems quite that not exciting. Clang with a resounding clang, the fiery blade collided with my opponent's sword. I exerted force, pressing forward, but he attempted to evade by leaping backward. In that instant, I swiftly withdrew my strength, moving away from his attack trajectory. Startled, he unconsciously stepped forward, and seizing the opportunity, I unleashed a powerful punch to his cheek. A thud echoed through the air as he was sent flying, landing motionless on the ground. A vein throbbed on my forehead, my agitation overriding the pain in my knuckles, which may have suffered a fracture or two. 
why are these troublemakers so lacking in motivation when they're the ones who initiate the fights? I pondered. Princess, perhaps it's best to leave it be. He's already unconscious, so there's no need to let it bother you. Focus on the remaining adversaries, Blaze advised, attempting to calm me down but I am already calm. Step approaching the unconscious body, I observed him peacefully lying there, his ear and half of his face disfigured and bleeding with crimson-hued blood. Crouching down, I positioned my face near his wounded ear and whispered, Don't pretend to be asleep, my friend. I desire a fair and square fight. Rise and face me, I shall give you a chance. I said earnestly. Dot. Suddenly, his eyes shot open, revealing that this adversary wouldn't be dispatched with a single punch. Desperately, he tried crawling backward, but to my surprise, my hand moved even faster while I remained crouched. Stab asterisk, G-U-H. With a swift and precise motion, I swung the sword. A sharp stab pierced horizontally, and the bandit's eyes widened, displaying his sense of betrayal. Don't tell me you actually believed me, I chuckled, amused by his na.veet. How could he trust the words of someone he had just tried to kill? Ah! Pain began to consume him, and he screamed like a madman. Igniting the sword once more, flames engulfed the blade, searing its insides. It must have felt like a scorching dot hot iron bar being thrust into his chest. I smiled at him, realizing it's better to face a smile than curses in the final moments of one's life, for I, too, am capable of showing a semblance of humanity in compassion. Run. A name echoed from my left, and as I turned, the entire battle scene came to a halt. Bandits lay scattered around, and among them, Ollie was the one who had fallen. He wasn't dead, though, as there were no fatal or visible wounds on his body, and he still breathed. What? I responded nonchalantly. It seemed quite risky to engage in conversation amidst a chaotic battle, but I admired Henry's audacity. It meant he had confidence and didn't care about the circumstances. Didn't I tell you not to kill? Henry shouted, his voice carrying an emotion I disliked. Anger. Oh, that. I twisted the sword, causing the bandit to cry out in pain once again. You see, I couldn't hear you because this fellow wouldn't stop screaming, I jested, but my attempt at humor seemed to fall flat as no one laughed. And you wonder why I call you a psychotic killer, Blaze remarked. How does defending myself make me a psychotic killer? Attack that bastard, commanded the leader of Dreadclaw, as a few remaining bandits closed in on me, giving the bastard in front of me hope that he would be saved. I didn't like that at all. With a swift movement, I silently drove the remaining sword into his chest, piercing so deeply that only the hilt prevented it from going further. The light in his eyes dimmed as he cast one final glance at his companions. It was a melancholic sight. Don't worry, most of them will join you up there. I promise, I whispered softly. Tud envied at a dull thud marked the corpse's awkward position, one leg splayed in a V shape, a sword protruding from its back, and blood trickling like a thin streak along the blade. It resembled a peculiar piece of art, albeit one that adhered to the subjective nature of artistic interpretation. Sighing, I rose to my feet, cracking my neck sideways as I surveyed the remaining adversaries. Only three remained, it seemed. Perhaps the others were occupied with the ground forces. One done and now three to go. I do love to keep a count. Chapter 69 Dreadclaw Part Point 4 You are listening at NovelFull.audio As I stood up, feeling a satisfying pop in my neck, I focused on the trio of adversaries who remained. System Notification You earned 70 blood points for killing. Total blood points. 120. I brushed aside the system notification and focused on bandits. Their expressions were concealed by their covered faces, but their apprehension and determination were evident in their body language. They understood the dire situation they were in. Sling asterisk I withdrew my sword from the fallen bandit's body, giving it a quick shake to remove the excess blood. 
the scent of burnt blood lingered in the air, invoking a strange sense of nostalgia. For the battlefield grew tense, and a momentary silence settled over the area. Time seemed to slow down, granting me a precious opportunity to assess my opponents. Each of them wielded a different weapon, a dagger, a mace, and a short sword. They were ready to make their final stand against me. Without uttering a word, the bandit with the dagger lunged forward, displaying swift and agile movements. I swiftly sidestepped his attack, narrowly evading the sharp blade. Swing asterisk in response, I swung my sword in a wide arc, aiming for his exposed flank. The blade whooshed through the air, but he managed to dodge at the last moment, narrowly escaping the fatal blow. I followed up with a kick aimed at his shin, but he quickly raised his hands, deflecting the attack. A distinct cracking sound echoed, indicating that he might have broken a bone in the process. Meanwhile, the bandit wielding the mace launched a frontal assault, swinging the heavy weapon with brutal force. Reacting swiftly, I parried the attack with my sword, resulting in a resounding clash of metal. The impact sent vibrations up my arm, causing a momentary ache. As the third bandit, armed with a short sword, assessed the situation, he saw an opening and lunged at me, aiming for my vulnerable flank. I swiftly spun around, evading the attack with a hair's breadth and countering with a quick kick to his abdomen. The force of the impact doubled him over, granting me a split second to strike with the pommel of my sword, temporarily incapacitating him. Taking advantage of the moment, I swiftly cladded my index and middle fingers of my left hand and poke asterisk, you crazy ass sadistic motherfucker. Blaze's voice broke the silence, questioning my intentions with a mixture of disbelief and judgment. I couldn't deny the sadistic nature of my actions, even though I knew it wasn't morally right. Because with a poke, I targeted his eyes, my fingers poking into his skull. Causing blood to spill from his sockets. It took him a moment to comprehend what had happened, but before he could scream, I channeled a powerful surge of lightning through my fingers. Blast. The intense discharge of mana caused his head to explode, painting my face with blood, while the remaining half of his body collapsed lifelessly. Dot silence in the aftermath, a heavy silence enveloped the scene. I took a moment to reflect on the lives lost during this violent encounter, acknowledging the harsh realities of the world I inhabited. Perhaps this counts as a second, now, I mused aloud. Observing the two remaining bandits, I noticed their trembling legs and loss of confidence. Fear had replaced their once-dot-assured postures. As the battle raged on, a wave of intensity washed over me, and everything around me seemed to fade into a hazy blur. The world transformed into shades of blue, a surreal backdrop for the relentless fight that unfolded. Despite the searing pain of the stab wound, I refused to succumb to the agony. Every movement was infused with a fierce determination, a refusal to let my adversaries claim victory. With every ounce of strength and skill I possessed, I unleashed a torrent of strikes, dodges, and counters. Their attempts to hurt me became fuel for my relentless pursuit of vengeance. Each blow I landed carried the weight of my hate and enjoyment, delivering a resounding message of defiance. I fought with a ferocity that bordered on madness, channeling my every emotion and dancing into a symphony of violence. In the midst of the chaos, I ensured that their deaths would be as humiliating as possible. I exploited their vulnerabilities, striking with precision and exacting my revenge with a ruthless efficiency. The battlefield became a stage for their ultimate downfall, as I orchestrated their demise with calculated brutality. Ha! Ah. Their cries of pain echoed in the air, mingling with the clash of steel and the thudding of bodies hitting the ground. It was a symphony of suffering, a testament to the depths of my entertainment. Time seemed to stretch, each passing second filled with a raw and unrelenting determination. The taste of blood and the sting of my wounds served only to further ignite the fire within me. There was no room for mercy or restraint, only a relentless pursuit of death, no matter how brutal it may be. As the last of my opponents fell, the weight of the battle settled upon me. I stood amidst the wreckage, my body battered and broken, but my hunger was not dissipated. Ha ha. 
I controlled my breathing. The blue haze that had consumed my vision slowly dissipated, revealing the aftermath of my wrath. Silence silence engulfed the battlefield, broken only by the sound of my ragged breaths. I surveyed the scene, a tableau of triumph and tragedy. The humiliation etched upon their lifeless faces served as a testament to the price they paid for crossing me. In that moment, I realized how much I've missed all this. Step I took a step back, my heart pounding, my body trembling with a mixture of adrenaline and exhaustion. The battlefield may have been drenched in blue, but it was the red stains of blood that would forever mark the legacy of my wrath. Brandishing the system notification about points being credited I refocused. Hey Henry, are all of you fine? I asked as I turned around, but what I saw was something I hadn't expected. Step. S. Stop. Henry shouted, his expression a pure example of horror and shock. I looked around and saw the same expression on everyone's faces. Whether it was the now restrained remaining bandits, Annabelle's group, or even Annabelle herself, they all looked at me with the familiar expression I had grown accustomed to in my previous life. It was a mix of fear, shock, betrayal, and disgust. It feels like home. I muttered under my breath. Chapter 70 Parting Ways Point 1 You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. As I took a step back, my heart pounded in my chest and my body trembled with a mixture of adrenaline and exhaustion. I couldn't help but notice the horrified expressions on their faces. Henry's voice broke through the heavy silence, pleading for me to stop. S. Stop, he shouted, his voice filled with a combination of fear and disbelief. I turned around, carefully surveying the scene and becoming aware of the looks on everyone's faces, whether they were the restrained bandits, Annabelle's group, or even Annabelle herself. Their expressions revealed a mix of fear, shock, betrayal, and disgust. It was a familiar sight, reminiscent of the reactions I had grown accustomed to in my previous life. A profound feeling of emptiness washed over me as I took in the turmoil my actions had caused. The realization that I had allowed my sadistic nature to take control, surrendering to the violent tendencies I had desperately hoped to leave behind, weighed heavily on my conscience. It feels like home, I muttered quietly, my words barely audible against the backdrop of silence. Memories of a life stained with violence and cruelty resurfaced, forcefully reminding me of the person I once was, and perhaps still am. In that moment, I understood the depths to which I had fallen. Despite the thrill of battle and the momentary satisfaction of victory, I couldn't deny the moral conflict that raged within me. It would take time for those around me to become accustomed to my extreme actions, as I had not even unleashed my full potential, it simply wasn't worth it. As the silence persisted, broken only by the sound of my ragged breaths, I grappled with the profound consequences of my actions. The blue haze that had clouded my vision earlier seemed to dissipate, allowing me to witness the aftermath of my wrath with stark clarity. The sight of the blood-soaked battlefield and the mangled bodies of my enemies evoked a twisted sense of beauty within me. With measured steps, I moved forward, approaching Annabelle who sat on the ground, her legs seemingly drained of strength. Her flickering eyes held a mixture of fear and shock as she looked up at me. Crouching in front of her, I reached out my hand, hoping to offer her comfort, to help her overcome her fear and move forward. But before my hand could make contact, Annabelle brushed it off, her voice quivering as she spoke. It was evident that she was on the verge of tears, and yet she held them back until now. D. Don't. Annabelle exclaimed, her voice filled with trembling emotions, her expression betraying her inner turmoil. It was clear that my blood. Stained hands repulsed her, evoking a profound sense of remorse and disgust. The crimson stains served as a haunting reminder of her own past traumas and the weight of their lives must have created a deep crack within our relationship but it wasn't that strong to begin with. I understood why she pulled away, why she rejected my touch. Annabelle's eyes, filled with a mixture of fear and disappointment, finally found her voice. Why that you are not my road she whispered, her words laced with sorrow. Her question reverberated through my mind, piercing my conscience and leaving me grappling with answers. 
I had sought a fresh start, a chance to leave behind the darkness that had consumed me before. Yet, in this moment, I realized that my past had caught up with me, and I had willingly allowed it to consume me once again. I hadn't truly changed, nor did I believe I needed to change now. I couldn't alter the choices I had made, the lives I had taken. I could have chosen a different path moving forward, but I knew deep down that it wouldn't have been as satisfying or enjoyable as the path I had embraced. Dot taking a deep breath, I turned away from the haunting scene before me. The battle had come to an end, and my presence was no longer required. It was time to confront the darkness that resided within my soul and wholeheartedly embrace it, just as I always had. Walking back, I entered the carriage that had been waiting in the midst of the battle scene all along. Inside, I found her, the mysterious woman. She clutched a small box in her hands, holding it as if it were the most precious jewel, a possession she would give up her life to protect. Closing the small distance between us, I positioned myself beside her, careful not to stain her delicate veil with my bloodied hands. She observed me with curious eyes, unperturbed by the gruesome scene I embodied. Leaning closer, my face near her ear, I whispered, I know the box is empty, my lady. She flinched, displaying a flicker of surprise, the first visible reaction she had shown. I continued, my voice low and commanding, don't worry. I don't care what kind of artifact you are using to conceal your mana or who you truly are. All I ask is for your silence, as you have been silent throughout this journey. And when you reach your destination, refrain from attempting anything deceitful with them. Understood. I posed it as a question, though I expected no response. She remained silent, confirming my expectations. Good, I affirmed. Reaching into the luggage, I pulled out a towel, perhaps belonging to Ollie, and used it to wipe the blood from my hands. I then gathered my belongings and noticed a small red box, the money the merchant had given me as advance payment. I retrieved a few coins from it, feeling that I deserved at least that much. Stepping out of the carriage, I found the scene unchanged from before, everyone still frozen in the aftermath. Is it that shocking that I mused to myself? Have you taken a good look at yourself? Blaze answered, reminding me of the unrecognizable figure I had become. Hey Henry, I took a few gold coins from inside, probably like twenty or so. I'll be taking that horse with me, hope you don't mind. I tossed five coins at him, but he failed to catch them, and they fell to the ground. Does he not realize the value of five gold coins? It's enough to sustain me for a few months if I spend it wisely. Well, I don't care either way. I proceeded towards the front of the carriage, where the horses were tethered. Since both the horses that Ollie and I rode are now lifeless somewhere, I'll have to use the horse that's been tied to pull the carriage. Run, what are you? Zark's voice cut through the silence as he approached cautiously, maintaining a few steps of distance. Don't worry, I'll be parting ways now, I replied without glancing at him. I had planned to do so when we reached Ivory Gate, but it seems better to leave now. Make sure to take care of Anna, this must have been quite a shock for her. I fully untied the rope and loaded the luggage onto the horse's back. But. Why? Didn't Henry say not to kill? And what about Annabelle? Look at what you did, Zark exclaimed, gesturing towards Annabelle. Her expression was vacant, devoid of any emotion. Her gaze felt hollow, bet she doesn't get what's happening in front of her. Make sure she gets some rest before you leave, I responded nonchalantly. I would have liked to stay and explain what kind of person I am, but I don't have the luxury of time. Ever since the incident in the illusory forest path, I've been feeling a sense of unease. Mounting the horse, I turned away from the scene, bidding a final farewell to everyone. In truth, I had already made up my mind to leave a few days ago, so it didn't make much difference now. As I rode a little further, Blaze broke the silence with a question. You were in love with that girl, right? I pondered his words for a moment, reflecting on the complexity of my feelings. Love. I repeated, a hint of contemplation in my voice. 
For me, love is not a simple emotion. It takes a lot for me to truly love someone, and when I do, I don't easily let go, even if they try to push me away. As I continued on my solitary journey, I couldn't help but reflect on the nature of love itself. Love was a force that had the power to both heal and destroy, to bring joy and pain in equal measure. It was a delicate balance that required trust, understanding, and a willingness to weather the storms that life inevitably brought. But for now, I had chosen to walk away. I had chosen to distance myself from the turmoil and the chaos, knowing that my presence would only bring more confusion and uncertainty. Love, in its complexity, demanded sacrifice. The road ahead was uncertain, and my heart carried the weight of the choices I had made. But as I disappeared into the distance, I held on to the hope that someday, love would find its way back to me, and I would be ready to embrace it with open arms, unburdened by the shadows of my past. She fucked up my love life haha. I chuckled as I thought about that person. A slash n, um. Sorry I guess.